everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. With me is the man, the myth, the legend, the yeti, Michael Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Fantastic, Mark. How are you this week? I'm doing very well. So, we are going to be talking about board games this week, just to mix things up. Decided to have a little bit of a change of format, change of structure here. So, we're going to talk about the games we played last week, the news, and why it doesn't matter. And then we're going to talk about our feature game, which is the Fellowship of the Ring trick-taking game. Now, I notice that this isn't the Lord of the Rings, the trick-taking game. You're going to have to explain this. Yeah, it's both, though. See, I thought the Fellowship of the... Anyway, you're going to have to explain this to me, because as people who've listened to the show for a long time know, I'm not exactly knee-deep in the Tolkien lore. I've only read the Silmarillion twice, so I'm basically a noob. I'm just joking. I've never read the Silmarillion. (laughs) Uh, For that, I have to know how to read. So, Walker, what have you played last week? Mark, you were nice enough to bring Versailles 1919 back to the table and then subject me to four more days of World War I documentaries. Okay, no, the documentaries came from Louis. You were the one who commented that you were going to have to go through down this rabbit hole. This always happens when I play historical games. I get intrigued and interested and then right up to the computer and or Netflix and or whatever streaming service I need to find yep. many documentaries on the subject. To a certain extent, I find it mysterious how little appreciation there is amongst the armchair historians for World War One. I'm not saying there's none. I'm not saying it's obscure or unknown. I'm just saying that when it comes to, you know, the big ones, the American Civil War, uh, even the American Revolutionary War, and certainly World War Two. You have endless armchair historian nonsense, like just reams upon reams upon reams of content. World War I, to my mind, is vastly more interesting. And particularly the political fallout. Like, look, if you care about World War II, if you find that interesting, surely Versailles is like the beginning, like effectively it's the beginning of the war. I mean, let's be frank. Yes. So like Mark said, yes. So you're bringing up all of these sort of bills and or, you know, motions and you're putting some votes on them and they're cycling their way through the talks and it brings up like a lot of things that actually happened and how oh, yeah. things you know traversed and actual bills and or or motions and anyway a lot of them it's very interesting so you've got the big ticket items so things like anschluss and indeed in our particular game Austria and Germany were not reunified. Uh, very much in, in keeping with history. So there are a lot of counterfactuals that happened, but very much in keeping with history, uh, Germany got pounded over the course of the conference. Anytime there was an opportunity to tank the German economy, we did. There wasn't as much German containment as there was historically, uh, in part because the French were denied their ability to hold the Rhineland. But there's a whole bunch of fascinating stuff. Things about votes for women, because there was the discussion of involving that in a variety of declarations leading up to the League of Nations. There was issue about racial equality. As the Americans, I tanked that. The Japanese were not happy about that. Nonetheless, though, some interesting things happened. The Germans and the Italians, sorry, the Italians and the Japanese, we didn't care what the Germans signed, did end up signing the Treaty of Versailles, which is not something that happened historically. And the Ameri- there was basically an English hegemony over the the rest of the world, which is kind of in keeping with the historical developments. The the Americans and the British very much dominated things. On top of all the issues that come up, there's a whole bunch of historical figures that come and plead their case before the meeting at Versailles. So we started right off with Mohandas Gandhi before he was the Mahatma. He was indeed present at a variety of the talks and was there to plead the case for colonial India. We also got the father of Rupert Murdoch showing up (laughs) <laughs> like, wait, what? <laughs> and so, like, and today's I, surprise guest is yeah, exactly. So, uh, I love historical wargaming when it allows you to learn things, or not even just inspire interest to learn more, but just even the wait. Rupert Murdoch's father was here. Fascinating, and things of that nature. And so, the sign nineteen nineteen definitely has that in spades. It is not a war game, but it is very much in the sort of war game idiom and published by GMT. This is a review copy we got from the publisher. And it's designed by Jeff Engelstein, who's one of those fascinating designers, not entirely unlike Martin Wallace. You know, he's got one foot in the historical wargaming community. He's got one foot in the Eurogame community. Uh, he mostly publishes in, in the Eurogame community. And this is one of the reasons why I sincerely hope that Zheng Ha, the co-design he did with David Thompson, ends up getting published. It's on the P500. Go and pledge for it. Go and pledge for it right now. One second. And done. <laughs> and Mark Herman. Yes. And designed by Mark Herman. So it's, as I said, it's not a war game. How would you describe it mechanically, Walker? 
I think it's a, a negotiation game, I think is how I describe it. Cause there is a lot of negotiation going on because, uh, you get, you get, uh, actions that are going to put votes on and, or you're going to resolve one of these motions and you can persuade, persuade people to resolve the motion that you want. And sometimes you want to anyway, because if you resolve a motion, you get to dictate what comes down all these different sort yeah, of Yeah, set the agenda. Yeah. Set the agenda, upcoming agendas and, and so forth like that. So there's like sort of, you know, multiple reasons why you'd want to do things. And even when you uh, resolve an agenda, there are multiple options on each one. And so you can negotiate which one is going to get resolved as well. Yeah, because you might just want to resolve the thing for the points. You might be somewhat indifferent as to the result, or there might just be one result that you desperately wish to avoid, but you're somewhat willing to negotiate the other option. So Versailles 1919 falls into that rarefied category of negotiation game, which is negotiation game Walker is willing to play. And I have my reasons for speculating as to why this is, but why don't you comment, Walker? Because you you don't dislike Versailles in the way that you dislike a lot of negotiation games, correct? Correct. I, I think the outcomes of negotiation aren't as severe as other. Oh, okay. You know, it's very small baby steps for each thing. You know, it's like mm. tracks go up one or two spaces and then, you know, not huge uh, penalties and or rewards for all of these things. That's illuminating. And I would say one of the other reasons why I speculated, uh, would speculate as to why you like it is because the negotiation is layered on top of a fairly robust, not quite area majority, but action efficiency kind of engine, right? It's not like negotiation is going to determine who is going to win an issue. It can help determine the contours of how and when an issue is resolved. Because all of this is fundamentally about how much, how many resources have you thrown at something. If I dump six cubes on an issue right up the top, well then, someone might fight me. And indeed, whether or not someone is inclined to fight me may be subject to negotiation. But yeah, more or less, I've got it. And then it's just a question of convincing me to do it a certain way or for me to, con to convince someone else to resolve it on their turn. Anyway. That, yeah. And it's also historical. Like, not only, yes. not only is it based on a historical event, but it's like you're sort of reenacting, you know, what you're – debating with the other, you know, world leaders and you're actually, you know, trying to pass these bills in a way. I think it would be super interesting if they somehow had another game that shot off this, like, you know, you played versus, you know, Versailles 1919 and then immediately right into, based on <laughs> the outcome, Ooh. right into a oh, World wow. War II scenario. A grand based. strategic, both the world wars. Oh, that sounds fascinating and almost impossible to do well. Yes, but would be interesting. Especially with the Italians switching sides. That would be, I would love that design. If somebody could do that, if so, again, someone with the perspective of, of a designer like Engelstein, like David Thompson, someone who, who knows how to do grand sweep in an accessible way and with historically inflected, that sound, that is exactly what I'd be interested in. Because there, there was a, there was an old timey Avalon Hill game called the origins of world war two, which was an area majority negotiation game. And it was not good capital N, capital G, because it was one of those historical games that was completely enthralled to historical outcomes, completely and totally. And so it was the, It was one of those situations where, oh, you get to be France. Congratulations. So just, you have no like, chance. It was like story time, yeah. Yeah. It was so bad. Let me just put it this way. It, it, there were some alternate scenarios. There was a whole series of alternate rules that people came up with in an attempt to salvage it, because for a long time, it was the only game of its type. Right, sort of grand strategic negotiation, play in 60 to 90 minutes kind of grand scope of history thing. And the French had the least amount of influence to place by a factor of like four. The Germans got to place like four times as many influence points as the French did. And the French had to place first. It was just a nightmare. It was so, as of turn two, it was so completely obviously facially pointless for the French to continue. They, they were completely unable to influence things. And this was just on a scale. You know, there were some powers that were slightly better off than the French, like the British, but even they got dwarfed by the Americans. It was so weird. Anyway, but I would, if, if somebody could do a modern take on that, I love games of this ilk. So, Versailles 1919, one thing I'd completely forgotten though was how terrible all the events are. Like, because a lot of it is about managing your national happiness. And I remembered that you completely screw over the rest of the world. It's like Ethiopia, <laughs> the Balkans, forget it. The Baltic states, maybe we'll think about you once in a while. But the almost all the events are bad for everybody. It's just a, it's just about pain management. It's like I need to win this issue so I don't get tanked, and that was pretty much the motivational structure for everyone. The first couple of turns, again, because we it had been a couple of years since we played it, were just when do the good events come up? It's like oh, there aren't any of those. Yeah, 
I want to get. I do want to go back to just like the documentaries I watched. Just, oh sure. Just today, because there's battles I've never heard of. There's this whole war between Japan and Russia. Yeah. That I you know heard about, but not really looked into this this huge naval conflict, which was surprising that that didn't sort of reflare in World War II, because a lot yeah. of times there's you know grudges and or things to prove, and when there was this huge already battle between Japan and Russia, I was surprised that there wasn't you know, rekindlement. My limited understanding is that they came close a couple of times, but that there was generally no appetite to to, to redo the Russo-Japanese War. But yeah, I think there's a very strong Atlantic bias that people have. And I think even people who are interested in the Pacific theater have a strong bias towards, you know, the engagements that involved their own country yes. or the English speaking world. I mean, it's just, there are huge historical blind spots. And if it was a, a major armed conflict between two people, uh, two countries that don't speak English as a first language, yeah, it's probably going to get ignored by a lot of the wargaming public. Yeah, it was like the, these this Russian force was under siege for eight months Woof. as they waited for the Russian fleet to go around the world <laughs> to get to where they need to be, only to be ambushed and completely destroyed wow. when they got there. Yeah, it was. it's pretty, very interesting. So if you're interested in, in these conflicts that you might not have heard of, just check out anything you want <laughs> on YouTube. I can definitely attest that as somebody who primarily played the Russians in Napoleonic War games... You have to accept that everything is going to happen on a longer time frame. <laughs> so that is Versailles 1919 by Jeff Engelstein and Mark Herman, published by GMT. This is absolutely more approachable. It is relatively rules light. It's definitely like light, medium weight, especially as far as historical games are concerned. And if you like the grim comedy of setting up World War II while destroying the rest of the world out of imperial arrogance... And I mean this sincerely, and that's totally a vibe I'm down for on occasion. Versailles 1919 is your game. It's truly extraordinary. Played more of Mass Effect the board game Priority Hagalaz. I had said I was mostly done with it. It's a two-player only game. Why, Walker? This is a rhetorical question, but you can answer if you can. Why do you think I played another game of Mass Effect Priority Hagalaz? Because the people that are around you, Mark, seem to really enjoy it. And you Bingo. are a person that really likes to help people along their board game journey and not dash their dreams into the dirt. You know what? You know what, Walker? I, I suspect that was at least ten percent sarcastic, but I'll take it. <laughs> I will feign ignorance to the level of sarcasm that I think was implied. Yeah, I mean, both of the Louis wanted to play it, so there we go. We play more Mass Effect, yeah. and the the missions are getting a lot quicker. And this, I, I commented that the first mission, the map was very, very closed, and consequently it felt just like a, a sort of grindy, stationary, very unpleasant sort of thing. The second map was a lot more open. The third map was a fascinating hybrid between the two, because it was a relatively open map. You had a little bit of room to move around, but the map was kind of subdivided into different chambers that were difficult to access, and so it was not uncommon for enemies to be across an impassable wall from you and you didn't have to worry about them or difficult or impossible for one character to join up with the rest of the party. So you have to pick somebody who's relatively self-sufficient. And this is all kind of okay, but again, it, it was leaning in to some of the things that I strongly disliked about the previous mission designs. One of them is that some people are just going to be hitting terminals and or opening doors. There are ways to make just hitting terminals over and over interesting. Hitting terminals is all you do in Space Alert. It's really cool to hit terminals in Space Alert. Hitting terminals is all you do in Space Team. Space Team is, is, is a bunch of fun, although that's a mobile game. But in the context of Mass Effect, the board game, it's like, okay, well, this is a terminal that needs to be hit three times over the course of the next three rounds. You're on terminal duty. That's what you get to do. Again, this, I think, fundamentally is a two-player game where you should saddle somebody with a murderer and a terminal pusher. And at the end of the day, you're going to be saddled with one or the other. The, the character playing Tali, Tali is a terminal pusher. She has been completely denied access to combat upgrades because you get combat upgrades by murdering things. And we need Tali to go hit buttons. That's how you win the scenario. And so, admittedly, there are ways to funnel upgrades to people in other ways. You get three intel drops, for example. You Anyone you want gets an upgrade. So naturally, we gave that to the people who have not been getting upgrades as much. I don't know. It just it feel, It's just a whole bunch of unsatisfying elements of the Mass Effect board game that makes me vaguely disappointed, on top of the fact that Garrus is so incredibly useless. Anyway, we've shelved Garrus. Garrus is benched. He's not coming off the bench. 
That's what it is. He can just sit there and be a, a, a little adorable cheerleader uh, with his little t- Turian spiky face. And honestly, there's only going to be two more scenarios max, one more loyalty mission, and then we close out the little mini campaign. And at that point, I'm, I, you know, I don't, I don't suspect their enthusiasm is going to take us back to go through Gosh. another campaign entirely. Even though uh, credit where credit is due, you can replay the campaign and never replay another mission again. Uh, there, there's enough mission missions available to do that, but I, I, I'm not really feeling it. But it's sufficiently fast, and I really do love the theme, so I'm willing to just play along to get along. I don't hate it. Just a series of, of minor niggles and disappointments. So there we are with Mass Effect, the board game, Priority Hagalaz by Eric Lang and Calvin Wong Tse Loon, published by Modifius. Eh, I wanted more. You and I got to play Fromage. This is designed by Matthew O'Malley and Ben Rosset. So you're just jumping on all the French titles this week? Yes. You're, you're, wow. Published by Road to Infamy Games. This is sort of like a little bit like Tolkien, where you put out your workers, dials are turned. Sulkin. 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 Well, just people don't want to yeah. get confused with the author. True. Put out your workers, dials turn, and you get your workers back after a certain amount of time. But in this case, it's just one big dial. And you put out your little workers to make cheese. And depending on where the little wedge of cheese is pointing or how hard, it's either one, two, or three difficulty of action you're doing. They'll come back in one, two, or three turns as the big cheese wheel turns. And so you're playing all these sort of mini games as they come in front of you because you can only, you know, access. I don't know how this, I don't think there's going to be an expansion that makes it five player mark. <laughs> there are four sections of the wheel. And so you get to interact with the section that's, it's, and everyone gets to do this at the same time. I think this is the key. It is simultaneous play worker placement. This is the key to fromage. I think if it wasn't, then it would be a little too light maybe. So you get to do two things. You get to make some cheese, you get to get some resources, and then the wheel turns and you do it again. And at the beginning of your turn, you check to see if any of your workers are pointing towards you, i.e., you know, they've done their time, they come back. <laughs> And you repeat this until... Well, my blue cheese maker did shoot a man in Reno just to watch him die. Poor guy. Poor mother. And then once everyone's placed out all their cheese, the game will end. There's some buildings that you get to do. There's some livestock you get to collect. Mark, what did you think of fromage? What I found fascinating, and this is a salient difference between fromage and Sulkin, is in Sulkin, you put the workers out and you wait... And then you pull the trigger for them to do something cool at the end of the period. In fromage, it's quite the opposite. You want to go do the expensive, quote-unquote, difficult action? Oh, you'll get the benefit right away. Instant gratification. And then you'll not see that worker back for another three rounds. And then for the next round, you're only going to have one worker available. And then maybe some round you won't have any workers available because you done made bad decisions. So it's encouraging you to dig yourself a hole. And I actually kind of liked that. The timing trade-off was interesting. What was fascinating to me is that seldom in a game of Fromage's weight, so Fromage is middleweight at its heaviest, but so seldom do you have Euro games like that where nothing costs anything, where everything is free. It's just the worker you need to place. On occasion, you need to throw some fruit at a cheese. But past that, you want to go make that cheese? Doesn't matter what kind of cheese it is. You get the right worker to do, it's going to cost you nothing but time. And the time will come later. It's just loans. Endless loans that you get to take out effectively in terms of time. And I found that very disorienting. I kept thinking about it like, oh, this is going to be a difficult cheese to make. I just got to... Oh, wait, no. I, I, I just do it. I just, <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just do it. I don't need to get the thing to make the thing. Ju- I just do the thing. Yeah, not a 15 pro- step process. Yeah, it was a welcome change. It was it was borderline disorienting, especially for the for the opening rounds. Like, you mean I could just get this cheese? Like, yeah, the cheese is there for the making. All the other resources that you talked about, the livestock, notice we don't say goats or cows, it's just livestock, or buildings, that's a secondary thing. You don't have to mess with that if you don't want to. Mostly it's about the cheese, which is appropriate. And I enjoyed it. It was uh, pretty much multiplayer solitaire. But if you're going to do multiplayer solitaire Euro, do it like this and allow for simultaneous play. That's great. I could imagine in some contexts, if you're really, really a tryhard and you desperately care about your international fromage rankings, you might have your workers and 
just wait for the person to your right to finish doing what they're doing so you see what's available for your future workers. Don't play like that. That That is a route to madness. It is open to you, but if you're inclined to make those uh, those kinds of, of weird delaying tactics, eh, go play something else. Because the key limitation that I find in Fromage is not resource-based, but is worker-based. Because each worker can only make one kind of cheese. There's three kinds of cheese, you have three workers. And sometimes you desperately need your blue cheese worker back, but they're busy. They're out in the provinces. They're not coming back for a while. <laughs> and that really is a limitation. If I were smarter, I would do a better job of looking at the board and thinking, okay, two rounds from now, what do I need? Okay, make sure I have that worker available. But it's one of those euros where you can play intuitively just what's happening this turn, or you can plan ahead. It was okay. It was nice. It, I don't think it was groundbreaking, but it was pleasant. No, no, not at all. And there's definitely there's definitely different you know roads to success. You know, it's not always just making cheese. You know, you know it's you pretty do, much about cheese. It is, but I mean, like you can either you know get combos going with the buildings, or you can satisfy orders, or you can yeah. concentrate on the scoring of the particular mini games. There's like an area majority or different cheeses on different shelves or, you know, all sorts of different ways. I think, I think at the end of the day, the bulk of your points, I've only played the once you've played more than I have. I would be surprised though, if someone could make a go of getting a majority of their points from anything other than the cheese mini games, because yes, it's all about cheese. Like you you satisfy an order when you're making the cheese. It's not as though it's a weird order satisfaction system, frankly, because you have these cards and they specifically say, okay, you want a two month old hard cheese. Okay. But it's not like you, pay a two-month-old hard cheese to satisfy the order, which is how it would work in any other game. It's no, it's just you show the card as you are making a two-month-old hard cheese, you satisfy the order, and that two-month-old hard cheese still counts towards whatever minigame you're going to be playing later on, whether it's the area majority, whether it's the chain, whether it's the making of pairs. I think pairs, P-A-I-R-S, not P-E-A-R-S, which is an excellent pairing for many kinds of cheese. A pear cheese, yeah? Yeah, no, it's a pairing. Yes. I don't know. Sorry, pairing in the sense of P-A-R-A-R. <laughs> I, I, anyway, uh, it's a whole thing. Uh, <laughs> now, I have to say that generally speaking, games about food are not really to my taste necessarily. No pun intended. No, no, that was accidental. That was accidental. But again, this isn't about like f- you need to. Uh, get the curd. You need to get the rennet. You need them then care about. No, 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 no. You're just placing. You're just placing out things. The, the 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 cheese element is very, very superficially in terms of the theming. And frankly, you're mostly going to be interfacing with the specific kinds of cheese if you go heavy into the orders route anyway, because they're the ones that mention specific kinds of cheese rather than saying again like this is a one month old soft cheese. It'll tell you what kind of one month old soft cheese you're making. But in terms of gameplay function, you only need to care about the, the, the type of cheese as mentioned. So I don't know if this is going to satisfy people the same way that it satisfies, like, distilled, for example. It gets far more into the weeds of making alcoholic beverages. And some people really seem to like that. I'm much more pro-cheese. I enjoy cheese. Cheese is, is definitely a, a food stuff about which I have a great deal of enthusiasm. And for me, it was mostly just visual. It was This, this could have been anything, more or less. But I do appreciate how they decided to uh, carry through the visual touchstones, like your cheese makers, all plastic things that go on top of your little wooden yeah, cheese. Wedges. I was about to go on, but that the production value is, you know, very well done. It, you know, has this big neoprene mat, so this giant board slides very nicely around as you rotate it. And like you said, plastic guys that cover up the cheeses, and you, and as it turns, they point, and you can see their faces, so you know they're ready to come back home. That's great. <laughs> I didn't know you had this whole narrative about the prodigal oh, yes. cheese makers. Bill looks across the valley and he looks you in the eye and says, I have done my work, sir. I am ready to come home. And Bill? Bill? Well, French yeah. cheesemaker Bill? Not French, Guillaume? Yeah. And then he starts hiking back through the fields. Okay. <laughs> what a feeling. I, <laughs> I will point out that this is the kind of game that lives or dies on its physical gimmick, and the physical gimmick works. Because it needs to be a turntable. You're literally just interacting with the wedge that's in front of you. And as Walker said, it's basically a four-piece board that you assemble on top of a neoprene mat. And that's what allows it to rotate around a a central point. And it works really well. In 60 minutes. It's also really quick, yeah. It's a very, very tight game. Because again, you don't need to go and get the resources to bake the cheese. You're just making a whole bunch of cheese. And the game is done when someone runs out of cheese. So there you go. It's all about fromage. On commence avec le fromage, on continue le fromage, on termine avec le fromage. C'est toujours le fromage. Just so. Yeah. So that's Fromage by Mathieu O'Malley and Ben Rasset. <laughs> see what I did there, Walker? Good. It's good. Did you, did you see what I did there? I wrote to Infamy Games. 
I was I was I was pretty delighted. I came in with no expectations, and it was it was charming. Good. Played more Behold Rome. This is a review copy sent to us by the designer Joe Clipful. This is the solo game that is by the designer of Gloom Holden, which then became Gloomhaven Buttons and Bugs, which began its life as a truly absurd uh, design remit. Can we do a solo Gloomhaven variation that consists entirely of cards that you keep in one hand? And physically, it was a marvel in a variety of very weird ways. And Behold Rome has more or less the same design remit. Can we do a kind of civilizational deck builder game? One of the explicitly mentioned design influences was the Imperium deck builders by David Tertze and Nigel Buckle. And it does feel an awful lot like Imperium in that it is nominally a, a deck builder, but the, intri- the it's got wheels within wheels and is vastly more intricate than that might necessarily imply. And I will repeat what I said initially about Behold Rome. It is hard. Not hard to play. The details are, I think, not particularly well explicated in the rule book, but there's a very helpful video by the designer that goes through in detail, and at that point, everything made sense to me. It's just that every card has four versions to it, and you have the option of upgrading and downgrading cards as you go along. Some cards have a lot of victory conditions attached to them, so you have to be worried about that. Some cards can only be played if you're in a particular kind of regime of the Roman empire or democracy or republic or whatever it happens to be at the given time. And so as you're progressing through the different eras of Roman history, you might be gaining access or losing access to a variety of cards, but then you might think, oh, but if I upgrade or downgrade them, then I could start playing them again. It's dizzying in terms of the options and intricacies and combinatorics. And I'm still playing like a monkey staring at a math problem. No offense to any monkeys listening, but uh, frankly, we are a pro-Gibbon podcast. As so I was say, I'm glad we closed the door, man, because they heard that. What a mess I'd have to clean up. Yeah, our, our biases are, are relatively transparent on this issue. And the great thing that I love about Behold Rome in terms of a solo design is that it is both literally and figuratively easy to pick up and put down <laughs> and just do a turn or two at a time. And sometimes I play multiple turns in advance, and then I start looking at it, it's like, uh, the, the, the sheer dizzying array of options are overwhelming me at this particular juncture. I need to set this aside for a few moments. And it's literally just a deck of cards. I'm always impressed at what designers, particularly in the solo design space, can do with a small number of cards. And Behold Rome, I think, is a masterclass in minimalism and maximalism. Minimalism in the sense of footprint, maximalism in the sense of options. And so I've been very much enjoying my games of Behold Rome. Maybe someday, maybe, I will feel like I have achieved bare competence at Behold Rome. I'm not there yet. It doesn't matter who I pick as an adversary. You get to pick various adversaries that serve as the benchmark for your score attack, because that's the victory condition. It's kind of a score attack, but it's not just, well, see how high you can get, and here's a sentence in the rule book kind of negging you for your performance, a la Just One or most Uwe Rosenberg solo games. This version in Behold Rome, you pick a particular adversary like the Celts, for example, and they tell you how many points the Celts get and they score a flat amount of points plus extra points based on certain cards in your deck, which further influences how you want to develop your deck over the course of the game based on the adversary you're playing. Maybe someday I'll get there, Walker. I have yet to encounter that glorious day. So that is Behold Rome by Joe Clipful, published by Mythfield Games. So I've been playing a game called Carvey a lot on Board Game Arena for the last few weeks. been playing with listeners and other people. This is designed by Toje Tong and put out by... Uh, Hans M. Gluck it is a Viking game like I've not played before. It uses sort of a Rondell type system, this giant sort of action track, like sort of like Wonderland's War or Red November, where you can go as far as you want around this track. But, you know, you're going to be limiting yourself if you go too far. And some of the actions, like there's this attack action that costs because you're using dice. I think it's called attaction. Attaction. You're using dice and the pips matter on the dice because you have to feed or I'm not sure they have horn. It's a horn value. And so when you go to a three horn value spot, you have to tick your die down by three. And so it's going to limit, limit you to where you can go. So it's like, oh, I could do this one that costs three and only move a little bit, or I can go, you know, halfway around the board and do this one that only costs one. It depends on how horny you are. Exactly. 
Or do I want to take up those horn spaces and block them from other people? Because only one person can be per spot. And you're doing all of this to move your boat around the map, to pick up trading tiles, to, you know, trade uh, hides and coins and silver to other villages or to raid other villages or to build up your tableau, get more Vikings on your boat so you can attack bigger villages. Anyway, I find it very intriguing. Always something... It's one of these very handcuffy games. You really have to dig to get resources because even to move your boat, you know, it has to have so many provisions. And so you're using, you have to get to the provision spaces to get your uh. boat provisions. And then you can use gold if you want to go to those extra spaces. But anyway. It is the anti fromage. Just so. And then those those battle tiles and trade tiles go on your board and unlock other things. And you have end game scoring conditions, lots going on. Looking much, very much forward to playing this in real life. This is Carvey. Yeah, w- when and if we get access to a real copy, I'd very yeah. much like to try it. Because based on what you've said and based on what I've looked at, it looks like it could be my kind of thing. Played another game of Revive. Revive remains one of my uh, perennial favorite medium-heavy Euros of the past few years. And this is designed by Helga Meissner, Isla Svensson, Anna Vermland, and Christian amundsen Otsby, And those designers in various combination have produced a lot of quality Euros that we've enjoyed over the course of the years. We played again with the expansion, which adds the Mystical Jellyfish, which, admittedly, is not one of the more tightly integrated expansions of Euros, uh, but it does add a lot more into all the various decks, and we've got it. And it doesn't add too, too much to the rules load, so I don't know. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on the expansion. Oh, I, I, I pretty well ignored it, in a way. Yeah, I saw how it was working. I sort of had a strategy at the beginning, and I decided to put my head down and just go with that. And it didn't do too badly. Oh, no. I Yeah, you, it's not one of those expansions where if you, you ignore it at your own peril. Uh, you had the same reaction, though, that I think people have had react, uh, the reaction to before, and I think it's going to have to influence my rules explanation. It adds a new score track, and any time you get points of one type, you can instead score points of the other type at a two-to-one ratio. So you can get jellyfish points. They're not actually called jellyfish points. They're loyalty points or victory points. And the trick is, though... You know, uh, various players see people, often me, going up the secondary track and assuming it's just for the benefits. But no, at the end of the game, it's all victory points as well. So it doesn't matter whether you're 25 in one track and 12 on the other. It's still 37 at the end of the day. And every time I've played with the expansion, somebody, whether they've played Revive before or not, has been like, oh, those are points? It's like, yeah, I said so, but I should really emphasize because people always seem to forget. But what I really enjoy about Revive is uh, twofold. Number one, I really like the card play. You get all these cards and you can slot them into your board. And the board, you can make changes to your board to make the slots more valuable or more useful. And you basically do the top half or the bottom half of of a card. And that's the chief way you're going to be getting resources. And so you have to worry about where your resources are coming from, but not in a handcuffy kind of way. So it's somewhere between Fromage and Carvey. We'll have a new new scale. And everyone will understand because Fromage and Carvey are pretty much the only there are games that everyone Ma- talks about. Mainstream. Yeah, you yeah, have mainstream. The most core mainstream games. And so they'll understand exactly what we're talking about when we say that Revive is halfway between Fromage and Carvey on the Fromage Carvey scale. Excellent. And the second thing that I really appreciate about Revive is the way that tracks work. Because you've got these three colored tracks, you advance them by building things on the board, and as you go past various thresholds, you get to get new toys. There's a lot of new toys to be had in Revive. And the toys that you get on your central board through the machines are definitely the ones that I like the most. They get powered through power, which cycles through every time you do a reset turn. And some of them get really get to lean into your engine, or sometimes they're just new routes to get a little bit of resources here and there. And that development and that pressure to build up your, your board is one of the things that I very much enjoy about Revive. Yeah, it's te- it's tableau building that matters. Like Mark said, not only are you building those mm. powered spots, but you're also getting these chips that you get to slot into the top and bottom of your board, which means every time you play one of these cards to get resources, you also, hopefully, if you play the right color of card, get to trigger these chips as well. And And... Like I said, it's tableau building that matters. And jellyfish cards are so good. I love those jellyfish cards. They are awesome. Anyway, so the expansion is called Call of the Abyss. I think it's very much optional. I really like it, but I really like Revive. It is not the kind of thing that fixes any core problems of the base game. It just gives you more options, more toys for all the toy decks, and a new way to get a new kind of toy. And it's easily ignorable. 
right? Which is both good and bad. It's good in the sense that it's not the kind of thing where it's like, oh, your previous strategies don't work anymore, and or it funnels all the the victory conditions down into a to, to a point of of monomania. Uh, but it is uh, somewhat unfortunate in that it causes the game to sprawl a little bit past what would be ideal. Because revive, at least the core game, is pretty clean as far as medium heavy euros go. Admittedly, somewhat of a low bar. Anyway. So I encourage everyone who, who likes medium heavy euros to give Revive a try, at least in the base game. And if you enjoy it, you know, try the expansion if you want, but that's Revive. Lastly for me, I'm going to talk about Castle Combo, which I also played on Board Game Arena. Glad I did, because it's fairly, it's one of the, it's a, just a straight up tableau builder. Like we've seen many times before, you, you're drafting these cards in your tableau, very much like Fantasy Realms. And it really just does not do anything new. It's like, you know, number of blue shields that are in your tableau or to the left, to the right. You're making this, you know, three by three grid and you're drafting these cards and making sure you have enough money and you score a bunch of points at the end. This is designed by Gregory Grard and Matthew Russell, put out by Catch Up Games. And I guess if you don't have a tableau builder like this, this would be fine. The art's very charming. Other than that, it's I believe, very forgettable. Castle Combo. And those are the games we played this week. Now a quick break to pay some bills. And we're back with the news and why it doesn't matter. Mark, we're enjoying Fate Forge. We are. They have a new crowdfunding announced. Chronicles of Khan second print and new expansion. It is the way of things. So new stuff, a chance to get it if you didn't get it the first time. It's a very interesting, very quick playing campaign style story driven game that we're enjoying. Yes, we are midway through the first campaign. We are. Uh, we also have the expansion campaign to look at, so I don't know that we necessarily need the extra stuff right now. Uh, but for those of you that missed the first one, this is an opportunity to get in. And if you have never had the delight of trying the uh, dice systems by Gordon Kalea of vengeance and uh, somewhat rift on in vengeance roll and fight this is your chance and the campaign elements so far are not burdensome which may sound like damning with faint praise but from someone who is so burnt out on campaign systems it actually is uh, a considerable praise sad news Corey Heath passed away recently. He was the co-designer of The Gang, which we've been enjoying lately. The Gang conjures the kind of magic that some of the best co-op games do, where you feel like you're engaged in some kind of weird telepathy. And so I really think that it is a tribute to his kind of design genius, because Corey Heath is perhaps best known for his incredibly groundbreaking work, Zendo, which is absolutely iconoclastic in so many ways and truly unique in the field of hobbyist board games. And I think that it's genuinely a work of design genius. Like it or hate it, Zendo is utterly unlike anything of its ilk, certainly at the time and even now to this day. And it's a great loss. I didn't know Mr. Heath personally, but I know a number of people who did. And they're uh, rather sincerely broken up about his passing. Apparently he was a wonderful human being. And it is a great loss to the hobby community. So rest in peace, Mr. Corey Heath. I will be continuing to enjoy your output in the years to come. So thank you very much for embettering my life. And this, just as a note, I know I don't want to get too preachy. I have not un infrequently at the end of episodes said, take care of yourself, take care of your hobby. I mean that sincerely. I mean both of those elements very sincerely. I've been talking about ethics in some bonus episodes in our Patreon feed about ethics, and I'm going to repeat something that I said there that sounds controversial, but and it, or at the very least is often forgotten, but I genuinely mean you have a moral obligation to take care of yourself. If you don't take care of yourself, that is a form of an abuse of a rational agent. And so please take the time. It's a hard time, and I know we have other moral obligations as well, and there's a lot of pressures. Self-care is a moral imperative, so please practice it. Thank you very much for listening to my TED Talk. Finally, uh, I would just like to give a shout out to Blue Sky. A whole bunch of people have been fleeing Twitter because of the, uh, what's a word for an unpleasant smell that permeates the area? The musk. The musk on Twitter has been very, very unpleasant. And so a bunch of people have been leaving. We are on Blue Sky. Find us on Blue Sky at So Wrong Games. If you want a more pleasant social media environment, I, I definitely recommend Blue Sky giving it a chance. And we are there. So hope to see you there. That is the news and why it doesn't matter. We now move on to our feature game, which is The Fellowship of the Ring, 
trick-taking game. This is by Brian Bormuller, published by Office Dog. It is slated to be published next year. We have an advanced copy from the publisher, although we have the retail version. Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what one does in the Fellowship of the Ring trick-taking game? What? You, you didn't watch the video? <laughs> I made a video. I, you did make a video, Walker. Jeez, all right. All right. It, <laughs> In L T R F O T C R C T T G, you're playing a slightly <laughs> modified uh, crew deep sea. The deck dic- dictates who the start player is going to be. Then you draft goals that must be met while playing a standard trick taking game. Yeah, Fellowship it's the um, it's the crew. It's the crew. It's the crew. So, and you're right. It's closer to the mission to the crew mission deep sea than it is to normal crew. Uh, search for Planet Nine. And although it has elements of the original crew, because a lot of the goals that you end up drafting end up being of the win a specific card of a specific suit. That is a recurring goal that you see rather often. The lineage is very transparent. And I just want to emphasize one thing. I don't think you have to worry about legal repercussions. It costs you nothing to do, I think, the polite and generous thing and cite your sources. I can, Again, I, I come from an academic background and in academia you can get away with almost anything so long as you add a citation, but I really do appreciate it when game designers, whether there's a set of designer's notes or not, in the credits are willing to acknowledge, oh, by the way, here's some, like, is it possible that Brian Bormuller, in absent, in isolation from everything else, mysteriously reinvented the crew all by himself? It's possible. I deem it unlikely. And so I think it would have been nice for there to be an acknowledgement somewhere in the rule book towards the crew. Agreed. So what you're doing is you can, there are 18 chapters in in this trick-taking game. and No, they, no, I want the acronym again. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so they say you can you can pick whatever chapter you like, but they want you to play through the story, like 1 through 18. And so you grab the chapter card, it'll tell you which characters are to be played, and they'll tell you which ones must be played. And then, like I said, you deal out the cards, and whoever has the four uh, missile, I mean, sorry, the one ring, um, gets to be Frodo usually, and gets to lead the hand. And then everyone else sort of drafts. And on the character card that you draft for Frodo, he'll tell you what you need to do. In some cases, he needs to win two ring cards in a four-player game, or four ring cards in a, in a three to four in a three or two-player game. And then there's the other characters that are listed on the card, like Gandalf or Sam, Merry Pippin, and or Tom ta- Bombadil, or Tom Bombadil, or a plethora of Fellowship of the Ring characters eventually come out. Absolutely. And they all have their own sort of goal that they need to do. And there are uh, also a whole bunch of additional cards that pop out in the chapters, like items or threat cards, lots of different things. Like Sam needs to win a particular card. And so they say flip a threat card. It'll give you a number from one to four, and he needs to win that hill card while you play the game. Hills being one of the suits. Hills being one of the suits. You know, Mary needs to win one or two tricks and Pippin needs to win the fewest tricks. So stuff like that. And all the characters have different things. So if you are into Lord of the Rings, I think this would be a great addition. And if you don't have the crew, I think this would be a great trick-taking game. Yeah, so I've been trying to think about it in the context of how well it executes the theme for people who appreciate the theme. And I'm not in a position to comment, really, because I I, I've, I don't have any enthusiasm for the Lord of the Rings property. I will say that I think the art is really cool. I think it's well done, and it doesn't look like every other fantasy instantiation of, of, you know, generic fantasy flight style fantasy art. I'm sorry, a lot of people love that style, but it's just, you know, it's been done to death. So it doesn't look like the kind of thing you'd find on a magic card. It doesn't look like the kind of thing that you'd find in sort of a John Howe illustration either. Not that I have anything against John Howe or Magic the Gathering art. It's almost like a weird stained glass effect. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, and so shout out to the artists who are credited, Samuel Shimota and Elaine Ryan. I think it's really cool, and I very much appreciated that. I, I will say that they have rendered the Hobbits as very, very attractive boys. I think that if this doesn't, this whole ring thing doesn't work out, that they might have a future in a Korean boy idol band. I think that their cheekbones are that on point, and so that is my career recommendation for them Hobbitses. I agree that some of the some of the goals and modifiers for each chapter 
do sometimes reflect what's going on in the story, but just the fact that okay, how it, so? Could you it, give me an example? No, I, I, this is not yeah, me yeah. being combative. I'm being not like a not like a. Gotcha. I read the Fellowship of the Ring. I noped out like fifty pages from the end, uh, but I did read it almost entirely. And I, the only thing that I vaguely remember is Tom Bombadil. Well, later later on in the chapters when you get items, the items seem to do sort of what they would do, like the shattered sword, you know, helps you do certain things. And later on, the Black Riders show up and they affect each of the characters differently. There's okay. like a, sort of like a dark rider for each character and it's a negative modifier. So it says, that, you know, if you have Gandalf, he, they get this dark rider and Frodo gets this dark rider. And it does give you like an overall feeling because it, it does advance you through the story in an interesting way. Yeah, so I was a little disappointed, at least playing three players, how little room there was to draft objectives. Because when you're playing three players, the way every scenario works is someone's going to be Frodo, with some minor exceptions. Sometimes Frodo isn't there. Sometimes he's pretending to be Mr. Underhill. And then he's not Frodo, he's Mr. Underhill. And all the rules that refer to Frodo don't work anymore. And then you get a little confused. But the rulebook clears See, it up. There you go. There's some rules that, that follow the storyline. Yeah, okay. Excellent point. Excellent point. But frequently in a three-player game, in a lot of the scenarios, the three characters you have to choose are stipulated by the chapter. So there's a list of like six characters that might be implicated, but a lot of those are just for when you're playing four players. And it's just the, the last ancillary fourth player takes one of the leftovers. And since one of the three players is going to be Frodo, that basically leaves one of two choices at the end of the day. And so it's, it's frequently a forced choice. On top of that, I'm going to give them credit for the two-player variant. It's kind of cute, but it doesn't interface with all of the possible victory conditions in an equally satisfying way. In particular, the way they can bury some ring cards makes Frodo's life very difficult. Uh, because Frodo... Ha Frodo... <laughs> Again, dovetailing on my, my previous comment about how it felt a little restricted in a three-player game, satisfying Frodo's victory condition in the early chapters seems to be your primary lift, and everything else is kind of secondary. So it's not uncommon to have a setup where, okay, Frodo needs to win four of the five ring cards. Good luck, buddy. Um, Pippin needs to win no tricks, and Merry needs to win one or two tricks. It's like, okay, so now uh, that's all right. So Frodo needs to win almost all of them. Okay, fine. That's cool. Except. And so suffice to say that a lot of the chapter setups felt very, very, very restrictive in a way that sometimes even the curated crew scenarios didn't. Does that make any sense? It does. So two points. One is you're talking about the ring cards, and that's sort of like another hook in the game as well. It's very much like Rebel Princess, where... Uh, you can't lead the ring suit until it's been broken, i.e. someone's tossed one off because they can't follow suit, and then you sort of break the ring suit, and then from then on, you can then play. You can lead you, ring you cards. You can then yeah. lead with ring cards. And the other thing is that there are two different sort of, on the chapter card, it'll tell you whether it's a short game or a long game. And like you said, with the choice of characters. So if you're only playing with three and there's five characters to choose from, you have to win the game with all five characters. So that means even if you win the chapter, you have to play it again and draft those two other characters. Because that's the thing with the long game. Every character listed must win. So depending on your player count and how many characters are listed, it will tell you how many times you're going to have to play that chapter. And in fairness, I, I think the long game structure is one of the most interesting innovations that the that the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring trick taking him actually introduces because it's not really that long. We're talking about a couple rounds of a trick taking game. That's not long at all. And that forces you to cycle through all these other different conditions. And the, basically the, the long and the short of it is you just can't fail any of the character's requirements. So it's not like a very complicated parlay or a very, very involved long thing. It's just an interesting way to go through all the different conditions there. So I actually like the, the longer scenarios better, frankly, than a lot of the short scenarios. That's, I don't see there's anything much else. Like I, th I find it interesting. I like how the, there's an introduction of items. There's a promo deck you can get that gives you like sort of a 18.1 scenarios where it'll like, you know, if you do well in a particular scenario, you get to bypass something. And it's sort of, you know, all of the items they've got from the Elven Queen. I thought that was kind of cool. Just the fact they include items, even though they're just for that chapter. I thought it'd be interesting if you, you know, got the items, you'd get to use it from chapter to chapter until something happened and you lost it. That would be kind of cool. But no, it's just for the particular chapters. But overall, 
I think it's a great addition, especially for those people that enjoy Lord of the Rings. So as far as I'm concerned, the Lord of the Rings trick-taking game, I'm sorry, the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring trick-taking game, I, I sincerely just want people to be able to find it. That's all. <laughs> and I, I can't help but notice that on Board Game Geek, it's listed as the Fellowship of the Ring trick-taking game. Lord of the Rings isn't in there at all. True. Heads up. Part of me is tempted to say you don't need it if you have the crew. But then I'm like, Mark, you're perfectly happy to have seven different medium weight Uwe Rosenberg farming worker placement games. So you're being a hypocrite. And I think if you are neutral to positive about the theme and you enjoy cooperative trick takers, I think this is a very worthy addition. It's a small box. It's relatively cheap and cheerful. It looks nice. It does a couple of minor things to differentiate it from the crew. That's fine. All told, though, uh, let me let me just break down why I prefer the crew. One of them is... I miss the communication rules. In the crew, you can communicate about what's in your hand. In the Fellowship of the Ring, you can't. There's a little bit of uh, some of the characters' pass cards at the beginning of the round. Yes. So that could be a little bit of communication. Yeah, but you can but do that in the crew as well. You're true. allowed You're allowed to uh, run up the, the, the emergency boy. And then there's the scenarios that are genuinely curated as opposed to just, does this feel like a random table setup from a, the crew mission Deep Sea? Oftentimes, when looking at the characters that are on available to draft from the Fellowship of the Ring, I feel like this is just like someone took a random setup of Mission Deep Sea and said, this is now a scenario. On rare occasions, and this is when I think Fellowship of the Ring is doing its best, I think, oh, this is something that the crew doesn't do, right? So one early scenario, I don't want to spoil anything from later on, but one early scenario has you pull out one of the suits entirely, shuffle that, and before every trick... The top card of that suit is revealed. And it says, if the person who wins the trick won the trick with a card lower than this card, they don't actually win the trick. It's won by the game. So, for example, you reveal a six, and then unless somebody wins that trick with a six or higher, they don't actually win the trick. So it's an additional hurdle. The composition of the deck changes subtly in an interesting way. It's an additional hurdle to winning tricks. The game might take a couple of them, and so to satisfy your victory conditions, you need to be a little bit more careful. When it's doing that, I'm like, okay, what you are doing is you're showing that you've iterated on the crew, specifically the crew mission Deep Sea. I just wish there were more moments like that and fewer ones where like, okay, well, this is just the crew mission deep sea with more setup and a different thing. Agreed. They've already said the other two are in the works. So maybe when the next two sets come out, there'll be even bigger differences. So we can hope for that. Yes. I cannot help but notice that uh, chapter 18 uh, ends with the same level of anticlimax that the first book ends on. Uh, any complaints that you might have about my disinterest for Tolkien ought to be sent to the customary place, supported at aircanada.ca. So possibly in later ones, because uh, um, what's the name of uh, what's the name of it? Gollum? Gollum is in this box. Yeah, he's he's following them to Moria. You can see him in the background. Okay, he's constantly yearning for the ring, Merc. Sure. I, I wish I could repeat the line. That Gandalf says he's constantly wanting it. It's drawing him. It's calling to him. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> All I know is that it's uh, really hard to be Boromir. More than likely. Oh, yeah, I'll go back. You know, some self-promotion. If you're interested in seeing what it looks like, <laughs> there's a new video on our channel, a new uh, sort of segment I've started up. There'll be more videos for it called An Unhelpful Summary. And the very first one is The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship <laughs> of the Ring, A Trick-Taking Game. <laughs> So that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very much for joining us for so very long about games. We really appreciate your deciding to spend the time with us. And we hope to see you again soon. Please do take care of yourselves, dear listeners. Take care of your hobby. Self-care is an important job and only you can do it. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Big. You can find all our information at SoWrongGames.com. Special thanks to What Does It Eat for allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our intro. You can find them at WhatDoesItEat.com. We hope to see you again soon, and as always, try to be right, but remember you're so very wrong. <laughs>